mute yourselves if you if you haven't mute, muted yourself just to cut out on any background music noise or music i will share my screen Tonight I will present what I call image impact and telling a story. What is it about an image that has impact the minute somebody sees it? And if you are interested in getting involved in any kind of competition, image impact is extremely important because the judges see hundreds of images and the ones that have a, an impact as it hits the screen are the ones they remember. And if you tell a story, even more so they relate to it because it elicits an emotion. So let me show you. First of all, you don't take pictures, you make them. You make them by how you see things and you wanna tell a story, even if it's a funny story, but at least you want impact, instant impact in the image. I shot this in Northern Italy, in the Dolomites, and I visualized the image. Certainly, I, I pulled off the side of the road. As a matter of fact, as I was driving up, I saw those clouds and the light rays and the light down into the, for, into the, the lower area. But to tell a story with it, I actually cheated by putting that little carriage in there coming down the road so that it tells a story. So I think about how I can present an image in a new way to tell a story, not just show the scene's beauty. For example, in this image, special light. Boy, if you are out and you're seeing that light happening and the beautiful clouds and things like that, that's when you want to try to capture a scene because your viewer will react to that, especially the, the warmer lights because they elicit an emotion. If you can elicit an emotion from your viewer, you really have a chance to have it appreciated and get into a competition in many ways. Now the viewer sees and understands the image without an, an explanation. That's what I mean by an instant impact, is that you don't need to, to explain. If, and if you're, again, in, in competitions, which you have at the club, the image that comes up in front of the judge and it tells the story instantly without you having or, or anyone try, oh, well, let me, let me tell you to come over here. Oh, oh, look at the little dogs coming out from the tree. No, no, no. It should instantly say that to you. In this image, I'm going to show you a little later in the presentation here that I, how many aspects of how I put this image together to bring an emotion related to the coloring, the sky, and telling the story with that little woman walking to the church. But instant impact, so important. Look how that image just jumps out at you and how it elicits an emotion. That little one in the mother's arms elicits the emotion. Well, I was down at the zoo in Atlanta and this mother orangutan had a little baby. And uh, one of the guards was walking along and I said, how old is the baby? He said, well, let me tell you something. The baby isn't her baby. The parents of that baby died from some issue. And this mother adopted the baby and she will keep that baby until it's 14 years old. But she just loves that little baby. So I'm thinking as I'm standing there, how will I present this? And as I'm standing there and taking some shots, mama does that. Now that elicits the emotion. That tells a story. And if you look at from the back, you see the background. I blurred it. I darkened it so that I would bring your attention to those two faces. And the eyes of mama looking at the baby tells a story elicits the emotion right there. That's the key element of the image. So here are the techniques that I believe and teach related to impacts and telling a story. Is the first 
Think about images with very simple backgrounds. Look at the one on the right here, very simple background, blurred background, depth of field, it, the foreground with the, the limbs sticking up or a little blurred before the head of that animal is sharp. Simple backgrounds, and I'll get into more of that. And then selections, making a selection within the image and using some creative filters. Not going to mention some in Photoshop because that's what I use the most, but there are other packages now that have really creative filters. You'll see what I mean by that. And then instead of just a single image and working on a selection and using a filter, you could use multiple images and put them together to create impact. And panoramas, I think, have wonderful impacts because they show the whole scene of what you were standing looking at. And the fifth area is what I call artistic reality. I don't particularly like the word composites, but that is what it is. We take many images, put them together, but we put them together in a way to present a piece of art and it's representing reality. So I call it artistic reality. That's my term for it. So instant impact, tell a story. <laughs> you can't help but look at that and think about the story of that. Well, first item was simple background. Very, very plain, a little bit of vignette, white vignette in this case to bring the, the eye into the center with the two frogs being friends and sitting on the, on the limb. Just very simple, brings the eye right to them simple background and even more so of instant impact and telling a story. The, the uh, rider roping the horse running tells a story. The little yellow flowers down in here so your eye stays down in the, in the lower portion of the image. Very simple background. Got this down in the zoo, in the Atlanta Zoo and was able to just Blur the background a little more, <clears throat> use the shallow depth of field, but I also then in Photoshop just darkened, <laughs> used uh, a little bit of a dark vignette and then highlighted the heads. Now, I thought, what do you call this? And I thought, oh, kiss me again, honey. Maybe that's the title. Well, I shot this at the zoo also. And I'm thinking, okay, that's just so neat to see these toucans, but can't do it with that background. And since it was in the cage, I couldn't move around. Often I will say to someone, think about how you can move to change the background and take a couple shots and move, take a couple shots. Didn't matter here, it was because it's in a cage, but I can make that different. I can select the bird and then change the background and bring out more of an instant impact by looking right at the toucan. This is Crog Street Tunnel, which is very interesting with the paintings there. And I've gone there recently, and this is from a number of years ago, and so it, it has changed. There are much more interesting paintings, or actually there are much more, but a lot of paintings are very interesting. But how can I get you to look exactly at the place that I want? Well, I will use a radial zoom filter to zoom the outsides of the main area that I want you to see. So instant impact, telling the story of, of the, the head screaming. And this was in Atlanta. Uh, it wasn't Comic-Con, I forget what they call this, this event. And photographed him and I'm thinking, yes, 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 yes. So I will do something with that background. And I'll use the radial zoom so that I key in right on the face. So just using a radial zoom, and keeping the face very sharp and allowing the zoom to take over the other part of the image. What a different presentation that is. Simple, simple background. Again, Crog Street Tunnel, zoom, presents that in a very artistic, very different way and so easy to do. Well, I was down in Atlanta and we had a presentation of dancers and I'm walking around and I know that the background is not going to be very interesting with all the people standing there. I simply wanted to catch the dancer somewhat in action. And I'm thinking, how do I present this so that I 
get the viewer to key right in on, on her. And again, the motion blur filter allow me to emphasize her movements and remove the background. The background is really there. You see all those colors and things are there. It's just blurred them tremendously. It works in, in helping her to stand out from that background and to show motion. So the other is to have selections and creative filters so that we'll do even more. I make a selection, photograph this in Roswell when they have the, the bike races. Uh, getting down low rather than getting up high, I wanna catch the, the face of the bikers as they're coming around. Now look at all that background. That's terrible. What are you gonna do with all those parked cars and the buildings in the background? Well, because I've gotten accustomed to using some of these filters, I make a selection of him so that I can keep him sharp, inverse this selection, make that selection, inverse it, and then use the motion blur on the rest of it, and then bring some detail a little bit more in each of the riders coming in, but not as much, not as much, not as much going back, so that it gives you a depth into the image, and you feel the motion, that's the key. So it, instant impact, and elicit any motion. Same with this one. I, of course, you can see what I've done with the background. So I made a selection of him because when I photographed it, I froze the action, fast shutter to freeze the action. I, as I'm thinking about it, I just wanted to get the composition so that when I could bring it in, select him, inverse the selection and use the motion blur on the other part of the image. So tells the story really well. And also you see on, the, on this image that I first brought in, I'm gonna go back to it. You see that each of the riders, this rider on the left is certainly more blurred because I want your eye to go to the sharper area. And then these riders coming in a little sharper here or a little more blurred here and then blurred here. And this one blurred a lot so that you see this fellow very sharp. And the same with these, selected him, did the motion blur, allowed this fellow to be a little sharper than these, which are moving faster. So I work on them to provide the way I want the viewer to see the image. Photograph this up in uh, North Georgia uh, and the Osprey Builder Nest and the parent object, I, the mom brings fish for the babies to eat. And so there was just a nothing sky, but I wanted to capture, freeze the action, catch the mama as she's coming very close to the baby and the nest, because then I can do something with the image. And I thought, okay, I'll, I'll just change the sky and make it more of an evening sky so that she's coming in and highlight the bird, the upper part of the of mom, you see it is highlighted here, but just bring that out a little bit more and allow the colors to give you the emotion. Look at your emotional response to this. You might say, oh yeah, that's neat. <laughs> okay, but this has a very different emotional response of the mother bird coming in to feed the baby. So multiple image layering is the next thing. I'm gonna use a number of images to layer on top of each other. Shot this up in Maine. I have a son now that lives in Maine and Maine is beautiful. And boy, I get down to the coast of Maine with the lighthouses and it's just so spectacular. So I saw this scene and I thought, as I was standing there, I'm already visualizing, what can I do to tell a story on this? I like the boat here with the water, but it's just sort of okay and the clouds are fine, but let me work on it a bit. Let me put in a sky that has feeling and emotional and put a little lighthouse here at the, at the bottom with the rays, the light rays coming out. So from this image, this is what I captured. And what I was thinking when I shot it was, Okay, I'm, I know I'm gonna change a lot of this, but I want to bring it in to have it have a, 
very neat feeling of the stars and the ship and the reflection in the water and put the lighthouse in there since it was up in Maine. Shot this image, this is a panorama and I thought, okay, the sky is nothing. It's not doing very well. This was shot in Amsterdam. And was, okay, but I get the detail. I wanna make sure I have all the sharpness that I need throughout because I can put a sky in and then that will bring more three-dimensionality to the image. So doing that, darkening the foreground and by darkening the foreground, I push your eye, the viewer's eye, more into the center of the image. And I do a little darkening in the upper portion of the sky to push your eye down into the image. But look at the difference in three-dimensionality that the sky brings by bringing out the structures. And I'm, when I'm putting skies in, because you can move them around, I will watch to have the, the dark areas against some light area within the clouds because that allows them to stand out more three-dimensional. And even over here, I just couldn't move them around to get this one in it, but I wanted these to stand out a little more. And the, the water is always darker than what the sky is when you have a reflection. This was recently in Santorini, Greece. My son, my older son just got married and he decided to have the wedding in Santorini. And so I, I went there, a very famous place. And he and his wife had a wedding gift of a, a massage at this little place here. So I'm standing there looking at this and the sky wasn't doing much. Doesn't matter in my mind, I think, okay, let me capture the foreground with those beautiful flowers and they can work against the really white painted buildings. And then I can add a sky that will bring three-dimensionality and give you a sense of the entire image. So doing that, now here's that aspect of having the dark dome against the light cloud creates three dimensions and this little whiter cloud over here. And these clouds pointing as leading lines down into the main part of this image. And the foreground's a little darker so that it pushes you into those very light areas. Another thing that I've learned over the years, especially from Ansel Adams' books, and I adhere to it in all my images, as he said, any dark area, any shadow area where the mind expects to see detail should have detail. So this is not blocked up over in this area, nor over in this area. Even though the original shot had that somewhat dark, I open up that area so that you see the detail. And his other statement was, any of the light areas should have texture. They should not be blown out. There's texture in those skies, in those clouds, even in the light areas. Shot this on one of my workshops that I hold out in the Southwest and it's just a nothing sky. And I thought, okay, it's an interesting rock formation, but boy, it doesn't have much going for it. What can I do? Maybe dark in the foreground, I want to bring the viewer into it. I want you to feel it. So let me at least take the sky and do a somewhat of a, a radial, uh, not even a radial, but it's a, a vignette with darker up there and allow the blue at the top to come down and warm the rock and bring out the color that is there. See, there really is color in the rock and in the foreground. So if I bring that out and allow that red against the blue, it really gives you the, a better feeling of this. And how about this over here, the highlight area? See, it's really there. Now with that darker sky, <clears throat> you see it and it stands out. Now, I recently, went back to this image and thought, let me make it even more interesting. How about if I use clouds and give more texture to the stone? You look at this and look at the stone here. It's not as much as having more stone feeling. And you may say, I've gone a little too far with that, John. Okay, 
it's my preference, you, but have the clouds that are leading lines and these areas against the clouds and dark area against light. Then I thought, how about I change the sky entirely and put a, a deer in there to give some story, just to tell a story a little differently. This is an area I take the workshop out Southwest called Bisti, B-I-S-T-I. I call it Bisti, they call it Bisti, Bisti Wilderness. Just really an interesting place to walk through and photograph. And that was the sky that was there. But you see the detail, there's detail in the shadow areas. Everywhere that I need, want you to be able to look in there, you can see the shadow areas. But if I bring your eye back into the center by darkening the foreground, and so often when I've been a judge for camera club competitions, um, the, one of the members will submit an image and they'll have that kind of sky in it. They don't realize that the eye goes immediately up to that sky because it's so bright. So and if you just put in a different sky, which today is so easy to do. In Photoshop, there's something called sky replacement. It might probably in Lightroom also, I don't use Lightroom anymore, but in, it's so easy to do. Now look at how that draws your eye down to the main part of this. And then I thought, play with it even more and bring different colors into it and see if that has impact. This is ship rock out in the Southwest also, very famous rock. The, the small rock in the background is called ship rock. And so as I'm there, I thought, do a foreground and mimic the ship rock with that rock on the left. And so the sky, use the sky so that it's a darker portion up and some light clouds down by ship rock. So they get a feel for this and allow the viewer to feel the foreground. And in fact, I call it a place to stand. Give the viewer a place to be part of your image, a place for them to stand. And I thought, okay, how about if I, whoop, how about if I take a moon shot? So two or more images, take a moon, put the moon in. Ah, well, that tells a little bit different story and fills that space. You notice, come back here, that's an empty space here. And so how can I fill that with something? Well, fill it with the moon. Shot this down at the Air Force Base uh, in Georgia, and it's sitting on the ground. And I thought, ah, this could be neat if I put a sky in multiple layers and make it look like it's flying. So somebody would say, how did you capture that in flight? Well, I didn't. I shot it sitting on the ground. So put in the clouds. So that and remove the part sitting on the ground, remove that, own that out, cropped it out, deleted it, and then put the clouds in. Well, John, you can't have a large plane doing that with the props standing still. Okay, so I'll make the props rotate with one of the motion filters. That way I can pre present this so much differently than how it was sitting there. Multiple layers, two or more images. Shot this down in Serenby, which is south of Georgia, and it just the, the ranch, the all the horse stalls was just so neat. And, ah, yes, this is neat, but it's not telling a story. It's not doing anything. It's just a neat structure. So photograph this character and put him in there and then darkened around him a bit so it tells the story. Fills in that empty space in the middle. Go back to that, you see how empty that is. Fills that space and tells the story of, he's a rider, he's a cowboy. He's coming in to get his horse. This is shot in Scotland, one of my favorite locations when I do the workshop there. It's Stalker, S-T-A-L-K-E-R, Stalker Castle. No, it's neat, the, the sky wasn't doing anything. Here's the funny part now, you're going, you know what I'm going to say. I look at a scene all the time and I think, okay, what can I do to make it better? As I said initially, what can I do that make it look the way 
I was thinking of it looking, and how can I have it tell a story? Well, we're in Scotland, so we should have a bagpiper. So I'll put a bagpiper and some wonderful clouds that'll emphasize the castle. And you notice the castle is dark against the highlights of the clouds. And the upper part of the clouds are darker and bringing your eye down to the castle. And in fact, if you look at this, the castle is the brightest area in this image. Darken the foreground a little bit. Let's go back and look at this. So that fact opened up the foreground for detail and texture. Look at the rocks here in the lower right compared to here. Tell a story. And that's what I had in mind while I was standing there looking at this. Because I've done so many that I, I think about what I want to do. This is a place I take a workshop uh, out in the Southwest in, in Taos. It's a Taos Pueblo. And it's a panorama. And it, the sky was not anything special. Okay, I can do something with that. So I could put a nice sky in, which makes it more three-dimensional. And I had photographed one of the fellows who was all dressed up in that area. And I could put him in there with a shadow. And he's looking at the scene where he probably lives. So I'm telling a story and giving you a way to see what I want you to see instantly. Instant impact, tell a story. This is up in the Smoky Mountains. It was a very foggy day. But wow, that is the fog is so pretty. And the light greens, it was in the spring, in April. Uh, yes, but what story does it tell? It doesn't tell the story by itself. You say, well, yeah, in a way, you know, the old building and the little shack in the background. Well, I also photographed two people that were all that were dressed up and up there the same day. And so I could put them walking into the old house. So instant impact with them. Watch the difference of having them come into it and tell a story. This one, Cataloochee Valley, which is up near um, Smoky Mountains, east of the Smoky Mountains in Maggie Valley. And you, it's a national park or a state park. And you go down into it and if you Go up there in September, it's the elk rut season and lots of elk and the male elks are roaming around and rounding up female elks. And so we're standing here very early in the morning. That fog in the, in the field was so pretty. And so I think, okay, good. Well, I was standing there, uh, two riders came down the road. And so I captured them, removed one and used one of them because they thought, yeah, it looks really good to come down the road like that. And I had the, one of the elks that I had photographed out in the field with his head turned around. So I'm telling a story. Here's a rider going past the elk in the field in the morning, mist in the valley. And that's my final presentation of that image. This is Providence Canyon south of Callaway Gardens in Georgia. I think it's about a three or four hour, three hour maybe down that way. Very interesting. Now here's the issue that I talk about with images all the time. When you look at an image, your eye is really coming in from the left and you roam through the image and you really want some way to keep the viewer's eye in the image. Well, the problem with this is that your eye goes that way and it leads you out the right hand side. Well, if I simply flip the image horizontally, and often somebody say, well, that isn't the way it was. Well, how would you know which way it was in this image? You can't tell. So this way you come in from the left, that darker area of the rock on the right keeps you from going off the left hand side and the upper left corner, the lighter area works well for you. And then if I, put some old prospectors in there to tell a story. And now your eye comes in and goes up there and I tell a story. So now you have a real impact from something at this level to this telling a story and making it interesting. 
The last one, or second to last, are, are the panoramas. So up in Smoky Mountain area and snow. So I did a three shot because I thought, just thought the scene was so neat. Well, I'm sorry, this was in New England. And thought the same thing, scene was so neat. So if I put it all together then as a panorama, I thought, okay, so what? It's a pretty red barn and all the white snow. Yeah, okay, but it's not telling a story in any way. And it may not even be that interesting as an image other than when I was standing there. So I thought, okay, I'll put some kids playing in the foreground. Uh, that's okay. But if I put a carriage in there, and then put snow in there, then I'm telling a story in a very different way. Yosemite, one of my favorite places in the United States. This is a three or four shot, well, no, it's probably a six shot panorama. That's El Capitan on the left and the three brothers on the right, has a good reflection. And I think it just tells a story just by itself and how the colors stand out. And I didn't, even, I didn't add the, the clouds, they were there, but the reflection is so good. So the panorama tells a story. Well, how about instant impact? This is in Scotland. And I said, okay, one, two, three, four, five shots, because the sun was doing such neat things also. So I wanna have instant impact. So here's the panorama. And then I darkened the foreground a bit, darkened the upper, sky area, call your attention to those light beams coming down and highlighting that area near, near the ruins of the castle. Instant impact. Yosemite, one, two, three, four, five shots, comes together to give that overall impact and tell the story of the valley with the clouds. One, two, three, four, five, six shots up in the Smoky Mountains in Caves Cove. There's a very recognizable area in Caves Cove. It, it's a regular stopping place. But if you walk from where the road is and go up into the woods a little bit, you get this angle. And put that together, gives you a much better interesting shot of this. And I used Luminar to put the Luminar software, Luminar AI, with the sun rays in, uh, okay, this is really an interesting shot. And you see this, the trees on the left are what I call containments. When your eye comes in from the left, you look at the barn and you come over to the trees on the right. And if your eye comes back to the left, it doesn't fall off the left side because the trees hold you in and the darker area on the right holds you in. But what's the story? Ah, so I thought, okay, let me do a little story. So. I, had photographed one of the bears sort of sitting on a log and just put that in there and, and tell the story. So I go from there to there. So artistic reality, they are truly composites, multiple layers, multiple image composites. Let me show you some of those. This is, these two are shots I did up in, in Maine when I was up there recently. And the one on the left is the way I shot it. The one on the right is what I, I did with it in order to put clouds in. I put the birds in the sky and I wanted an evening feeling. And I also put more of the shrubbery in the foreground so that there wasn't all the rock going up because it was on this lighthouse also. It's the same lighthouse, just a different angle. So up in Berry College, I've done a workshop there a number of times. And it, there's some really neat places. And this is Possum Trout School, uh, which is on the one of, one of the areas within Berry College location there. So I did the panorama. Uh, okay, let's just do something a little bit more interesting. So I had the, the uh, skeletons and took them. I have the witches doing the brew and the skeletal dogs. And so just made up a fun image with that. 
again up in New England at Christmas time. Wanted to tell a story a little bit. So I put in some interest, the fellow over on the left with the sleigh and the horse and the young fellow with his, his sled. But again, need to have something that will make it more interesting. So putting snow coming down, and giving a little more richness to the colors in the background, much more interesting image. I do a workshop in the Smoky Mountains every year. In fact, I have one coming up in October and I have four open slots. If anyone's interested, you can contact me. Uh, I and I rent a fantastic cabin. So you would get a room of your own, private bath, jacuzzi in every room. So I up there in one time and this couple was standing watching this fellow work on in his shop and I thought, oh, they just look good. I can use them somewhere. So I photographed them and then selected them so I could use them separately. And one of the locations in the Smoky Mountains is this one, two shot panorama. And it had the little cemetery as part of it. So I put them in it and call it the mourners. So now you have the image. Now look at the difference of the colors also. I improve the colors in the background, more yellows, bring that in more, they're there, everything is there and the sky is there also. I just needed to improve the saturation of it and put them in with the shadows from their bodies based on the way the light is working and take advantage of the fact that they look like mourners at the cemetery. Here's that one I had shown you earlier. Shot this out west uh, near Abiquiu and where Georgia O'Keeffe lived many years ago. And that's how I shot it, thinking I will do something with this because it's such a different church, beautiful. So had a sky that I shot differently at a different location at a different time. Okay, I can put that in and warm up the foreground and do a little bit of darkening down in the foreground area some that allow those crosses to stand out dark against light. Notice back here, they are there. So I, I want to emphasize that three dimensionality of them and get that little lady, Indian lady, select her, put her in there with the shadow based on how the highlight is working. And that's the final image much more interesting. It tells a story of her going to church. And then recently, one of the new features in Photoshop is called Neural Filter. And in the Neural Filter, you can click on something that says Winterize, and it just turns the image into a winter scene. So I took it in just to play with it. And with a click, that's what it did. I also, in the Taos Pueblo, in one of the back streets, thought it's really interesting with the shadows coming down. And so I need to do something with the sky and to bring this out, bring it more three-dimensional because it's, it's rather flat. So if I improve the color, bring in some clouds, open up the shadow areas and put that little lady walking in there, that tells a story, instant impact and tells a story. This die, remember reading left to right? Well, this doesn't work right because you're gonna go off the right-hand side that way. So if I flip it horizontally, okay? And if I have a rider and his dog, I put them in there with it. Now I'm telling a story and that those rocks on the right push you back in to see what's happening in the image. Same scene. Night shot, put the sky in, and put a little lady dancing in there just for the fun of being creative about it. Shot this up in, <clears throat> now this is at the Smoky Mountains. This is a, one of the trains that you at one time brought passengers up to the, not Smoky Mountains, to Yosemite. And I just wanted to capture it and say, what could I think about doing to make it more artistic? artistic reality of it, just doing some filters on it 
multiple image. Here's one though, that really is multiple images in many ways. This is Venice from one of the well-known bridges looking into the city. And this is my capture. And I just wanted to be sure I had detail everywhere and I can remove some of those fancy boats and put an interesting sky in there and have the foreground reflect the color of that sky. Now, what about that empty space in the water, John? That doesn't tell a story. Oh, well, okay, I'll get a gondolier and I'll place the gondolier in there as he's rowing into the scene. And that's my final presentation of that image. So you go from here to there to there. Old Mystic Seaport in Connecticut. Same idea, putting the clouds in, creating a story, putting the birds in. So there's all kinds of things to see. Here's one of my final images of a composite. <clears throat> the man taking the horse into the desert area and the great sand dunes out, in, out west. Well, here's my original shot. I just wanted to be sure that I had detail on all the shadow areas and texture and the highlights. So that's my shot out of the camera. Photograph this guy wandering around in, in Taos, New Mexico. I thought, I'll use him someday, somehow, that'll be good. So when I decided to put them together into that sand dunes, I needed to photograph a horse. And so a friend of mine owns a horse up in New Harley, Georgia, went up there, photographed the horse. And down in Cerebi, which is in Palmetto, Georgia, south of Atlanta, walked into a stable down there and there was a saddle and a stirrup. And so I could put all of these things together, put him in there walking into the sun. Oh, put the horse in there, but boy, it can't be bright like that. So darken that, put the reins coming from the horse's head to him walking in, and here's my final presentation that I call Into the Sun to tell a story. Well, here are some of the other ones that I've created. One on the left I call Heaven's Gate. These are multiple images put together, artistic reality. Very good friend of mine, Darcy Pino. She uh, had me work with her on workshops down in Costa Rica. She lived there for many years and knows it very well. So she created that one on the left and then she created this one on the right with multiple images. And I have in fact a large print of the one on the right, which I love very much. The model is actually her daughter. So the, look at all the different images that were put together in that one. So here's one she photographed her daughter up at Old Car City and then Change the background, put something up front to sort of waves around, and then put some jewels on her head. And, whoop, and that's the finished presentation of that image. Then she showed me this one. Here's what she started with. And she put those together into that image. Put some music in that image, put some coloring, and other fishes down in there. And that's her finished presentation, artistic reality. Her last one of her last ones, here's her daughter again. This is uh, inside the church in, up in the Smoky Mountains. She then changed the, how everything should look with a little bit of swirls and allow the face to be dominant. Put the shell on as a hat and then some feathers and some trees coming in. And here's a beautiful artistic reality painting in really, it's not a painting, it's a print, but that's a painting. And another one she's done recently with the butterflies and very creative stuff. She's not the only one, Dominic Chapineau, which lives here in, in the Atlanta area. Look at that as a multiple image Every piece of that is a separate photograph that she has and puts them together. And this also, every one of those women, 
she had photographed at a, an outing somewhere and had them in her catalog and her folders of people and the train and put that together as a final image. Beautiful pieces of art. Got la just a last few. Kelly, Her Her Kelly Herwitz R. I had seen her work a number of years ago, these two in particular, and got in touch with her to see how she put all of that together. And Kelly Dobson, who was one of my first students in Chicago, did this one. <laughs> how, how creative is this? Just so creative. Created this one recently and this one. So artistic reality is a new trend in photography. It is a whole new category of photography. So there's street photography, documentary photography, uh, portraits, all kinds of things. I think there's a new category I call artistic reality, but call it digital art if you want. Even in the Professional Photographers of America, their convention, I saw these images, these final pieces, photographs being displayed. Look at the number of pieces of individual photographs that were used to create that final piece. So if you would like any one-on-one -on -one tutoring, I'm available. And with an initial meeting, I give you a half hour free. I have some books that show how to do a lot of the things you've seen in this presentation, adding light rays, doing all kinds of things. And I have a book on Yosemite that shows you the best locations at the best time of day to photograph them. So you don't take pictures, you make them. You make pictures. Why was Mona Lisa smiling? Hmm, I don't know. Fine art, image impact, telling a story. Any questions, please ask. And that's my presentation for today. Thank you.